folks are so chatty tonight. <laughs> it is wonderful to see so many people here um, to celebrate this beautiful book, Healing the Divide, Poems of Kindness and Connection. Thank you for coming. Um, at the urgence and encouragement of James and Megan, I'm going to start off with a poem of my own. It's yeah, hanging up for Poem City. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to start reading a poem of my own. Yeah. That is... Yeah. It's hanging up on uh, the, the window of Katie's Jewels. It's here for Poem City. My name is Samantha Colber, and this is Love and Water. After a full body massage, my body is an ocean. I swim inside it. I saw the creator there. No, I felt the creator. No, I knew the creator. And she was a pool, and I wanted to dive in, swim in her too. It's all back to water, back to whence we came, back to large life liquid listening to what we're made of, love and water. Um, many more beautiful poems are in this book. and. I'm so excited to have here tonight James Cruz, the editor, along with Vermont poets Mary Elder Jacobson, Megan Buchanan, Allison Prine, Patricia Fontaine, Laura Foley, and Carol Cohn. They're all featured in the book alongside such amazing great poets such as Lucille Clifton, Rita Dove, W.S. Merwin, and Naomi Shihab Nye. Um, it's, and it's what I love about this collection, that there's such a diverse array of voices with our emerging and local poets paired with some wonderful known poets. And I'd like to thank James for conceiving of this book and thank Green Writers Press for publishing it. I do urge you all to get your own copy tonight. They're available at the front counter. We will have Q&A and time for book signing after the reading. A few housekeeping items. Um, the bathroom is located at the back of the store, to the right of the back door. And we do lock the front door to um, keep down the disruptions. So in case of an emergency, if you need to leave, the back door is open. And the back door is this way. If you haven't already, please mute or turn off your cell phones. And I'd like to let you know about some upcoming Bear Pond Books events. Next Tuesday, April 23rd. We're hosting an event called In Defense of Butterflies, a migrant justice poetry reading mm. with Nico Amador, Cynthia Dewi Oka, and Natalie Centers Zapico. Then on April 30th, we host local author Jennifer McMahon for a book launch for her newest novel, The Invited, which is a fun ghost story set in Vermont. You can find out about these events on our website, bearpondbooks.com. You can follow us on Facebook or Twitter or sign up for our newsletter in the um, clipboard that's being passed around. I'd like to thank Orca Media for being here tonight to film the event and Poem City Montpelier for featuring this and many of our poetry events in their Poem City program. Since we have so many guests this evening, um, I'm going to introduce the editor of the book. And for biographies of all of our readers, I encourage you to look on our website or to buy the book and read about the poets in the back of the book. James Cruz is a regular contributor to the London Times Literary Supplement, and his work has appeared in Plowshares, Crab Orchard Review, and The New Republic, among other journals. The author of two collections of poetry, which we have here tonight, The Book of What Stays and Telling My Father, he lives on an organic farm in Shaftesbury with his husband, Brad Peacock, and teaches creative writing at SUNY Albany, along with uh, poetry and mindfulness workshops that one day I hope to attend. Please help me welcome James Cruz. Thank you so much, Samantha. I'm so glad that she agreed to read one of her poems. I think the response she got, um, maybe we'll convince her to do that again in the future. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the anthology and read a couple of poems, and then I'll turn it over to my fellow poets. 
Um, so I just have to tell you, it's a little surreal still to see this in real life because I conceived of it probably about a year and a few months ago, and I've never had a project come to fruition so easily, so quickly, and just with so much encouragement and support. And so um, it's, I, I do know that I did a lot of work for this. Uh, I definitely remember all that, <laughs> um, but it, it just flowed. And so I, I think that's when, um, that's sort of what has made me realize that there's a hunger for conversations like this about, you know, kindness, and you know, there are there are poems of grieving and sorrow in the book, but um, they they are more life giving to me than um, a lot of other work or uh, things that you'll see in the media. And so, um, definitely, if if you can't buy it tonight, borrow it from a friend or whatever. I I really believe that poetry is life giving, especially at a time like this. And um, so that was the driving force behind this. And really, the idea just came to me in the shower one day. I was getting out. The title came to me. And as I often do, I started to talk myself out of the idea. Like, no, <laughs> you know, um, I really need to focus on my own work and, and all of this. Um, but luckily, I have a very supportive husband. He's like, you know, it sounds like you're really into this idea. Why don't you just do it? and maybe see what happens. And what happened was everything really fell into place. Um, so maybe that can be encouragement to all of you if you're pursuing your own projects. Um, I'm always happy to answer any questions that you guys might have about um, the anthology or the work that comes up, anything like that. Uh, I'll read my, my poem in the anthology, and it's the title poem of, of my latest book, Telling My Father. I found him on the porch that morning, sipping cold coffee, watching a crow dip down from the power line into the pile of black bags stuffed in the dumpster where he pecked and snagged a can tab, then carried it off, clamped in his beak like the key to a room only he knew about. My father turned to me then taking in the reek of my smoke, traces of last night's eyeliner I decided not to wipe off this time. Out late was all he said, and then smiled, rubbing the small of my back through the robe for a while, before heading inside, letting the storm door click softly shut behind him. Later, when I stepped into the kitchen again, I saw it waiting there on the table, a glass of orange juice he had poured for me and left sweating in a patch of sunlight so bright I couldn't touch it at first. Um, the, the book Telling My Father is about losing my father. It's been about 20 years, but uh, it took a long time to write this book to process that grief and one of the regrets was that I wasn't able to actually tell my father that I was gay to come out to him. Um, but I sort of realized after a long time and a lot of kind of processing of it that he did know and that there were many moments like that when, um, when it came out and when he was able to show me that kindness and that acceptance. And so um, there are a lot of poems like that in this book. I'll read one more um, that came out of that particular time of just kind of combing through memories and um, settling on um, these moments of connection between us. This one is called Chore. Too young to help, I watched my father hack and dig at the old oak stump, pulling up tap roots whose prickly hairs clung to bits of red clay they brought into lake-chilled air. He chipped away at heartwood garn soft in rain until it became a pile of pulp around a hole in the ground filled with soil and seed. Smelling of sweat and tobacco now, he took off his t-shirt, wiped his face. We worked hard today, didn't we, he said. I think we deserve a little rest, and I nodded. We lay back among clumps of rye, rye grass as dusk spread across the field 
and a fine mist fell over us like a net, pressing our bodies closer to the steaming earth. Um, so this is the last poem I'll read. Um, this one was another another poem where I um, kind of realized that my own attempts to be kind and um, take care of my father were perhaps a little overbearing and in, in vain because as he was ill, he had a hepatitis C from tattoos that he had gotten when he was a, a young guy. Um, and so eventually um, he couldn't really have salt. He wasn't supposed to. Um, so, you know, I went to the grocery store and did my best to, to stick to that diet. So this is called strict diet. <laughs> Though the doctors said no salt, salt was all my father craved. His body bloated, skin waterlogged and gray. Still, he wanted potato chips, honey-baked ham, greasy slabs of Polish sausage from Pikatowski's Deli. He begged for pepperoni pizza, garlic butter, ribs slathered in sauce. But when I did the shopping, I searched only for labels that said low sodium, no preservatives, instead bringing home heads of broccoli, turkey burgers, shredded wheat. <laughs> Poor dad. <laughs> and when he died anyway, guilt gnawed me like an ulcer. How could I have denied him those few final pleasures until I found Big Mac wrappers stuffed under the car seat, <laughs> jars of pickles in the hall closet, and hidden among wads of tissues near the nightstand, his stash, a half-used canister of salt. I sat down on his mattress, now stripped of sheets, and studied that blue label with the girl in the yellow dress, holding her umbrella against a rain of salt still falling from the sky. So thank you all so much for listening. Please welcome our other poets. So we're going to be going in the order in which we're seated. So we'll start with Laura Foley. Thank you, James. And thank you, James, for making this book. Um, looks really beautiful. I'm going to start out with the poem from the book. Um, can you hear me? Is this good? Not too well? Closer in like that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so my granddaughter is now three years old, and um, she had a bit of a rough uh, entry into the world. This is called Neonatal ICU Prayer. Let us be gentle as we tend you. Let us hear the mechanical whirs and hums you do. Feel the vibrations of our coming and going. Let us not walk briskly by, but abide breathing in unison. Close our eyes or open them wide as you do, smallest and most trusting of all of us needing care. Last week, my first grandchild healed here. May the same be true for all of you, our tiniest kin in sheltering globes. So, um, I thought I'd read a poem about Paris. I think it's in many of our hearts and minds these days, today and yesterday and going forward. Um, so I, I spent quite a bit of time in Paris when I was younger, and um, we practically lived there for many, many summers. Film noir. In Paris, with my professor and his shy teenage son, not much younger than I, whose presence I try to fence from my awareness, our apartments an atelier, our courtyard shaded with trees of heaven I look down on before descending the new brass elevator 
clanging through the ancient stairwell's stygian depths to sip bitter espresso and smoke filterless cigarettes, as if I were born doing it all that summer, pretending I'm someone else. <laughs> so um, often in the summers, I'll find a, a chrysalis, a monarch chrysalis, and bring it inside and, and uh, watch it uh, open, become a butterfly. So um, it's a process. And uh, this year, I did that also. I found one in, uh, <clears throat> must have been in September. So it didn't open until uh, October. And this poem is about, we, and we ended up naming this butterfly Octubre. Uh -huh. I, I'm trying to learn Spanish. And so, you know, one word by word. Octubre. If you saw me driving in this pelting rain, you'd never guess my errand to buy lilies for my butterfly. <laughs> He'll savor the aroma of flowers this cold November day, since wild blooms have faded into memory, if he has one. Octubre lives in a screened-in cage, because I couldn't let him out in last week's snow, could I? He seems content, his feet sticky against the screen, pleased to drink when I uncurl his proboscis, with a toothpick, dip it in honey water while he sucks through his trunk-like tongue. I say he because he has two spots like eyes on his hind side that mean boy. Good for our family of two lesbians, two, two bitches, a shepherd and a lab, and 30,000 girl bees who spend the whole autumn dragging the hairy drones out of the hive, killing them, dumping the corpses in a heap underneath. I'm just saying, it's good to have some masculine energy present. <laughs> Even if it's just one monarch who hangs upside down all day and sometimes flutters his gorgeous wings. <laughs> So last, uh, last May and June, my wife and I uh, hiked the Camino in Spain. We, we, managed, um, we managed the 500 miles. <coughs> Our name. We were given the name as we sat defeated, weeping on a bus, having given up for the day. We knew what we were called. Or in a coffee shop. Faces bright and eager before dawn, backpacks slung by our sides, or collapsed, resting in the shade, leaning over a bridge, staring down, limping to vespers on aching knees, crossing a wet poppy field toward others of our tribe, having lost the way, or getting sick roadside, or striding through small towns, locals running out, saluting us, calling us by our one God-given name, Pilgrim, requesting that we bless them. And one more. Oops. Yes. Um, this is for, for Mary Oliver. It matters. It matters that Mary Oliver woke early and walked along the bay as morning sun tore the sheets of darkness from the sky. It matters that she carried a notebook and cared to look into a kingfisher's soul, to dig in wet sand for clams in which she later tasted the salt sea, erupting in her mouth like sex, that she let the soft body of her body love what it loved, which was Molly. It matters that she loved a woman, it matters that we each wake to stride our own snow dunes, that we find in each day something of value. Even the last ash leaf hanging on a winter limb, shivering a bit, then falling into stillness, over and over to lose ourselves into something larger, something better. It matters that I clutch my stack of her books, those fields of light, now that her body has gone into the cottage of darkness. And, and now Carol 
Falcone will read. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here, and uh, I was fortunate to um, attend long, quite a while ago one of James's workshops. Hold the microphone for, up. Oh, I'm sorry. The, I'm sorry. Um, I was happy to attend one of James's workshops a few years ago, and have been following his writing ever since. And uh, I think it's um, had an influence on me. But it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. The first poem I'm going to read <clears throat> is the uh, is the one from the book. It's called Revisit, and it's uh, it's t and it's and it's um it's called Revisit. And it's, de and it's dedicated to my younger son. <clears throat> what do you do, what do you see when your baby comes home at 50? Do you remember the child who couldn't sleep a single night for two endless years, who wouldn't eat most foods, who pushed your hugs away, who gave kisses to no one? Slowly the years passed without a hug, a visit, a Christmas card, yet whatever brought the epiphany, his father's death, a midlight crisis, or realization that half a life had passed him by much too far. He came home at 50, erasing years of separation, just to visit an experiment, still prickly but ready to talk, to reach out an inch or two, perhaps to build a fragile bridge across those missing years. <clears throat> still working on it. <laughs> um, and uh, the second poem comes from another um, uh, <clears throat> anthology that I'm proud to be part of. This is called, the book is called um, Birch Song, Poetry Centered in Vermont, Volume 2. And uh, I was happy to be one of the editors as well. This is called Summer Residue. The porch light has burned out. I climbed the ladder to replace it. A good time to wash the globe for a new season of light. But the globe holds a handful of soft, pale wings. Furry fragments of those gentle creatures last summer who sought warmth and safety, who came but could not leave. It seems cruel to wash them out and clean the glass once more, yet I cannot put the tattered bits together. I can only remember the fragrant summer nights when clouds of moths will come again, try to enter heaven's gate and fail. Or possibly their greatest goal is really sacrifice, self-immolation, one brief night of flight and freedom before a glorious fiery death. I like to think the choice was theirs. And the last poem <coughs> is called um, Angels. Angels. I don't really believe in angels, but sometimes I wonder if they are around somewhere. Do they look like the dandelion seeds that float on the breeze on a summer day? Or the seeds from the milkweed pod that burst open in early fall? Silky, soft, fragile, but strong enough to spawn another generation next year. Are there more angels in a cemetery <coughs> guarding the dead? Are there more in a church listening to the choir? nodding a cord with the serpent, flying in and out of the steeple, tugging the bell ropes in the sudden windstorm that blows through the town? Are there food-covered angels watching to ensure the hungry fill their bags with enough to feed the family next week? Because it is going to snow and there are no jobs and the baby is sick and the car broke down yesterday. Maybe they meet at the park and sail up and down the skateboard ramps. Their robes trailing behind like sails on a ship, just for a little fun in between saving and guarding and comforting and watching. Maybe they meet at the animal, sh animal shelter to hold the kittens and puppies, to throw a frisbee, frisbee for the dog and scratch a cat's stomach and whisper to them that someone will come to take them home and love them forever. I would like to think that there is an angel with long, elegant wings of soft white feathers, a loving smile, grateful hands, graceful hands, her flowing gown caught by the wind, watching me write a poem about angels, wondering if they really exist and why. 
who might send me a message, perhaps a crimson sunset or a breath-stopping full moon or just a whirl of milkweed seeds to say, yes, we are here, believe. <laughs> And you're the magic wand. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, everyone. <gasps> Look at all these faces in here tonight. Beautiful people. It is such a wonder and an honor to be part of this anthology and again thank you to James and to all the amazing um, forest of Vermont poets that are part of this anthology. So I'm doing the five poems in five minute challenge <laughs> and the first is from the anthology it's called Squirrel Rescue. I know who you are but you weren't introduced, so may I Oh, for gosh sakes. Patricia Fontaine. <laughs> Thank you, Bernadette Rose. <laughs> Squirrel, rescue. Gray squirrels have taken apart the feeders, one completely demolished, another with its green chain uncoupled. I fixed it. When I next look out, one of the greys dangled, hind ankle wedged hard in the notch of the feeder. On went heavy gloves, a red wool jacket, boots. I'm here to help you, I said, a gravelly hiss. I reached out, pushed up, squirrel glove, a tangled royal, suddenly squirrel high in the air, twisted cat-like, landing, paws out on a cedar. Nearby, my heart was quiet, a shimmer in the place where we met, where the me flickered out for an instant, rescued from its invisible, shuddered knowing. So sometimes things just get to you, and uh, this is called rattled. Here is a small truth. If one doesn't stop when most rattled, we keep rattling harder. Looking for the lost, I feel old engines turn over, rev into fear of the mind thinning. A blank field of hot uncertainty, fiery and numbing. Walk circles room to room, reopen drawers, rummage through paper dregs in the blue bin, try to recall what I may or may not have done. Like looking for cast stones in a murky pond just out of reach. Or perhaps in a different pool entirely. Looking out, I see the lake has cobbled together the frozen flows that yesterday rose and fell in the hard north wind. When the door opens, the shock of cold is welcome, quiet. And the quiet settles like another lost thing found. Mm. Sleeping with stones for Holly. On the fall forest path, fierce wind has taken grown leaves and laid them down in an even mosaic. I said, my fear tears at my sleep. She said, the pressure to end it, older than she is, sometimes does not rest. I asked us to stop and notice what is still, as a forced teacher might. We named the dirt, the stones, a metal railing that framed the drying ferns, skinny cedars, lightly tossing lake. 
She told me she sleeps with stones. What kind, I asked. Depends on whether you want to hold or be held, she said. Tonight I retrieved a stone, smooth and two-toned, cold with night air. I will sleep with it in my palm. Fear can move to its heavy, rounded house and be warm. Lighthouse. The island lighthouse has a, a sturdy round tower, a thick beam, intelligent. It skims the pointy firs. Tireless path sweeps over my rumpled bed out to sea where those more lost than I can follow the flash to harbor. Once I climbed up stones that climbed the stone spiral up to the glassy crown. The light itself a huge jewel with a cool burn. Ready, turning effortlessly round and round the minute dark came. Heartening, constant. And the last one is called Lifted. There will be a few familiar names in here. Car dead this morning. The gristle of not wanting this or anything to change renews itself in my mouth like a cud like threads of stale celery that don't break down but catch and choke in the throat. Ashamed, the insignificance of this trouble stirs such grief. Like my mother would say, there are people with no feet. Tow truck en route, I weep as if the car was a person forever lost from me. In the green light along the north branch, I remember about turning towards suffering. It feels old and powdery. The birds are quiet in the gold weight of late morning. Turn right over the arched bridge. Follow the river upstream. A bird flies in and out of new leaves. Hurt hums into the heavy heads of the grasses, follows pollen as the trees loosen their yellow dust. <coughs> there is a fracture in the bone of the heart. And yet, I am able to walk holding it like this. Thank you. And now, Mary Elder Jacobson. I think it might be easier to write a poem than hold a microphone like this. I've never had to do this before. Ah! Um, hi, everybody. And it's so kind of you all to come and connect in this way. It's a very big honor to be in this book. Um, it might be a bigger honor to be a part of something that is such a huge, not a part of the problem. And thank you, James, for putting this out there and collecting. These poems are um, really keepers, I think. Uh, there's a poem in this book by Jane Kenyon called Otherwise that I've lost count of how many people I've given that poem to. Some people in this room I've given that poem to when They've gone through certain kinds of losses or struggles. So I think you probably find a lot of um, poems to keep and give. I'm going to read three poems. And the first poem is the, book that, uh, the poem that's in the book, which is for my son, uh, who is now 20. Parenting has moments that move as slowly as molasses, and some are as fast as a lightning bolt. And the day before my son turned 18, I went for a walk, 
And I suddenly realized, oh my God, he's going to be a legal adult tomorrow. And in my family, the women, when we have thoughts like that, we can suddenly have a catharsis. But I was interrupted from my catharsis by this moment. Taking a walk before my son's 18th birthday. Not too far from home, I spotted a painted turtle toddling along, heading across the dirt road. I paused there in the hush and just stood still so I could watch and held the dog back on his lead. When I heard an engine louden along the road, then rev uphill behind me, I shifted a little, worried a bit, then moved myself over and waved, flagging down the sky blue pickup with its gravelly rumble until the driver, with his lowered window, finally slowed to a stop, his eyebrows raised, looking quizzical. So I pointed out the small pedestrian in the road, and the old man gave me a nod, cranked his wheel, and curved around us, leaving behind the steady turtle who made it, and me, still mesmerized by a moving shell. This poem is a little bit more maybe imagistic. It kind of came to me like a collage might, like fragments over time, and I didn't know what I was going to do with all of them, things that I held on to. And then um, an, the actual thing that's at the beginning happened where I was by a lake and a, a dragonfly landed on a floating birch leaf. And um, I should tell you, in case you don't know it, there's a word in here, chain mail, which is the the interlinked um, armor that the medieval knights would wear. So I use that in here. Dragonfly. Late morning, one settles down on a leaf afloat, plying his chainmail oars, his little raft a fragile boat. My father would say darner where I saw a dragonfly. Who knows any longer what a darner is? Time flies. Late afternoon, lakes hem unraveling, sun squints toward dusk, leaning in to finish her day's stitches. Evening now, I listen to one upstairs window closing as I turn to open up another, letting a luna moth go. Then watch as my father, grown tired, senses the fading light above the fabric knee patch he's been sewing. Handing me his spool and needle, he smiles just to see how easily I swim his thread through the oh-so-tiny eye. My father passed away about 17 years ago. So this poem is a kind of a, it's a conversation, so it'll be, it's a mother-daughter conversation. I'll try to change my voice a little bit as I, <laughs> as I do that. Um, and the form of it is a guzzle, which is from the Eastern, um, Eastern literature, Arabic, Turkish, Persian. Uh, and so it's written in couplets, and um, one word gets used over and over again as the last word on the second line of each couplet and also gets used as the last words of the um, both lines in the first couplet and then at the very end in the last couplet the the author usually puts their name as a kind of signature on the poem so this is sorry a guzzle forgive me my bad, beg pardon, I'm sorry. It's a never ending list, I think. So many ways to say sorry. Mom, I say, how about we don't say sorry today? What's that, dear? I can't hear you, she says. I'm sorry, I'll be right back. One sec, let me get my hearing aid. <laughs> I rethink repeating myself. What's one more sorry? 
Moving past 80 now, my mother's begun to fail. And as she leaves the room, I begin to feel sorry. I can hear her humming, but then, oh gosh, she sighs. Looks like my battery died. She's back with, I'm sorry, sweetie. <laughs> my eyes aren't what they used to be. Here, maybe you could help me? Again, I'm sorry. Sorry to be such a bother. It's gotten so trying. It's no trouble, Mom, really. It's me who's sorry I can't help more. I can see what you mean. It is hard. Here, try this. That should do it. Now, no more sorries. OK, thank you. You always were so good at fixing things, just like your father. Oh, there I go. Forgive me. Sorry. I do go on. I'll stop. I've just been missing him so. I know. There, there. It's OK. Don't be sorry. We hug each other tightly and long. If I could fix it all, I would, I say. I'm sorry. You know, I can see your father still in all his children. It's too bad he can't see you now, Mary. Aren't we both sorry? Buchanan. Pulling up my pants. Um, I'm Megan Buchanan, and uh, okay, so I'm totally welled up from all the poems, and I feel like the book is like has a, this reading has a different feeling than any other reading I've been to. It's like I feel like there's this sort of cloud that's like coming off of her already, who's, who, all of us having responses to these poems that are like these beautiful, very moving poems. So anyway, I'm feeling your poetry love cloud. <laughs> um, so thank you, James, for making this book, and um, to Bear Pond for having us all here. Um, I published a little book um, in 2017, and um, some of the poems I put in my book were, uh, I felt confident about, and some of them I just wasn't, you know, like I just felt like it was kind of, they were so personal and interior, but I just put them in anyway, because I just kind of went for it. And so the poem that James asked me to, um, asked if he could publish for this collection was one of the sort of more interior poems that I um, felt like was sort of a private poem. Um, and it's a sonnet, and um, it's called My Daughter's Hair. And... Um, I just was looking through the table of contents here, and it's like daughter, 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 daughter. So I wasn't sure what you were up to at the time, but now I get it. So anyway, here's my sonnet called My Daughter's Hair. And um, I just came back from visiting this daughter, and she's now uh, three inches or four inches taller than I am, and she's in divinity school. So she, she turned out great, but she was always great. Here she goes. OK, sorry, too much talking. My Daughter's Hair. I haven't yet been able to find words, a sentence for what happens when I brush my daughter's hair and divide into thirds, enough hair for a family of four, one barber said, the rare one I trusted. There we go. Honeycomb colored braid, she's out the door for school, green coat, pink backpack, and rushing right on time, little Virgo, to the bus. One woman show with harmonies, alone, amazed, bowed down, deep inhale, oh, the joy contained in waves and waves, a shimmering song my daughter's hair sings as she floats each afternoon high up into a tree. Against the clouds, she climbs far beyond me. It's my secret poem that's now in a book. Okay, I'm going to read two other ones, and this little tiny one is called Pocket, and I think of, this is sort of my connection with what I call the great I don't know what, or God. Pocket. And I'm here again, hanging out in the pocket of God's favorite shirt. In worn blue flannel, filtered light and sound, I'm suspended, along for the ride. Tag along, tiny human, I'm held and warm, horizontal against heartbeats. I can't see the sky.
And I'm going to read a guzzle too. And you gave the lesson already. So <laughs> little couplets that have a repeating word. Um, <clears throat> I didn't do all the like wheelie popping at the end with my name and everything like that, but it's okay. <laughs> okay, and I'm reading this because of the title, really. It's called Almost Spring in Everyone. Here we go. Almost Spring. Okay. At dawn, aspen shimmer brand new beneath dreaming blue peaks. One heart speaks and beats against another's spine, bright as forest fire. Oh, holy breakfasts, potatoes and coffee, bacon. In this new dream, we climb trees, rock faces, crisscross railroad yards to later find spring water singing in our first language. The old stone carver leans through coffee's blue steam whispers this. Beneath our skins lives animal nature, visible to him. Recognition lifts me like a kite. A flowered crown lifts off the ground, carried south by a crow, released onto a rooftop. A blue healer and my long-legged child dream in quilts below the tiles. Blue evenings I find answers in rain clouds, runes made of cinders or incomplete strangers. A baby leans over her father's shoulder, slowly raises a hand, anointing me. Thank you. Yeah. The wonderful Allison Prine. Thank you, it's been so great to hear everybody's poems. Um, thank you, it was great to hear your poems, Samantha, that was a treat. Thank you, Bear Pond and Poem City, which is one of my favorite events. It's such a wonderful thing. There's just, just so beautiful to see so many people here together celebrating poetry and celebrating this amazing book, James, that you put together. And I think we're all hungry for this and needing it, which is probably why it um, you tapped into something that's needed right now. So I'm going to read the poem that James chose, which is a love poem um, that I wrote uh, for someone I've loved for the last 26 years, my wife, Kelly. It's called Naming the Waves. Above the harbor, these clouds refuse to be described, except in the language with which they describe themselves. I stand here in the morning stillness, which is, of course, not a stillness. The sky spreading open in the east with amber light while drifting away to the west. Here, I can sense how the world spins us precisely in its undetectable turn, somehow both towards and away. The blue of the harbor holds the sky in its calm gaze. This is a love poem, be patient. Between you and me, nothing leaves. Everything gathers. I will name for you each wave rolling up on the harbor sand. This is the first breath of sleep. This, the cloth of your mother's dress. This, the cadence of our long conversation. I want to show you how everything on this harbor has been broken. Shells, glass, rust, bones, and rock crushed into this expanse of glittering sand, immune to ruin now, rocking in the slow exhale of the tide. I'm going to read another poem that I wrote on the same harbor. It's called Watermark. This morning I noticed congregations, moorings, sanderlings, even rubbish seems to have a being together, an affiliation through proximity. A jet tears through the clouds, giving the sunrise a beautiful scar. 
every landscape is autobiographical. I recognize my own industrious rhythms in a gathering of blackbirds on the sand, boat and bird noises like kitchen music from childhood, efficient clip movements of a woman who raised me but has long been gone. The difference between the ocean and a picture of the ocean, distracting inflatables, a foghorn, car engines, the piercing cry of an old herring gull, burn of salt in the eye or sting of sand fleas, ropes clinging against masts, a dog barking insistently in the distance, on and on without pause, maybe in distress or pleading or announcing something of great importance over the harbor, over the sand, and out to the sea. I would like to speak to the man in charge. The racket is like a drawer of silver clattering to the floor. This morning, outside my kitchen window, a sharp-shinned hawk tore apart a yellow bird in the apple tree. What do you propose we do when our questions become useless? Every day I forgive you these messes. Goodness is not a false positive. The bloodline is not a false positive, nor are the ghosts who raised me. Go ahead and wield your mighty blankness. I too can sing into my pillow, sir. Then I'm going to end with a poem called Yard site, which um, in Judaism is uh, the anniversary of the death of a, a loved one, often a parent or important family member. <clears throat> Grief lifts almost imperceptibly from a boulder to a stone. For a while, I'll carry it in my fist. People like me do not want things to go too quickly. Standing still, eyes closed, breeze tossing a few strands of hair across my face. I smile to myself when people ask for my help because they want to be normal. What is it called when you don't try to be very good or very bad? Dear, lonesome normal. Each night dreams ruin you. What other animal has learned to hate itself? The summer, the eider ducks got sick. We walked down Jeremy Point and saw how evenly apart they chose their spots to die, finally answering the question, how close, how far? If there are any questions, James, do you want to maybe take the podium and see if there are questions about the anthology or any of our poets tonight? Sure. We are here for your questions, comments, <laughs> answers. I know we're all kind of a wash and we're kind of a wash in images right now, so um, you know, if you don't have anything, we understand. <laughs> Pure intuition. So just, so the question was, what was the formula for, um, choosing the poems that went in the anthology? And, um, so it was pure intuition. I just really trusted whatever kind of came across my desk or whatever I came across. And it was just this little jolt. And um, there were poems that I couldn't include because I had a very, very small budget. So I wanted to include a Mary Oliver poem, for instance. But that was $400. And um, we just couldn't afford it. Um, totally worth it, but we just couldn't afford it. James. 
first off, thank you to everyone who read and thank you for putting this anthology together. Um, I think anthologies are important because of the way they can meet people many years down the line. But um, for you specifically, James, in the, what you read from your collection to your father, did you think of any of your poems as letters? Or if not, maybe just think just a few thoughts, and this could be for anyone as well, about writing a poem to someone that isn't going to speak back or can't speak back. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hadn't actually thought of it that way. Um, the the poems kind of to my father were about him as being epistolary or letter poems, um, but I think that's that's absolutely accurate. Um, you know, the I, I think another poet, maybe Louise Gluck, said something like, "You can only really understand a relationship once it's closed," and so when someone passes away or when a uh, you know, a love relationship ends, that relationship is closed, and you can then kind of go back and have the perspective to really understand what happened or really understand what that relationship was like. And so a lot of um, those poems about him helped me do that. Um, but, I, but I also want to say that I think of a lot of the poems in the anthology, um, if not all of them, as kinds of letters. I mean, they were all, for me, about connection, whether with self, the natural world, or with other people. And so, you know, they do have this sort of quality of reaching out to the world or, you know, specific people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If there's nothing else, then uh, we'll hang around, happy to chat. I know it's a lot of pressure to ask a question, um, but we, uh, we will be here if you come up with anything else. But otherwise, thank you so much for coming tonight and listening.